Hello everyone, welcome back to Fanblade. It is the last episode of this series. I'm going to finish this neck and then get it on the base, and then I'm going to take it to a gig and play it. The gig is three days away. I really need to get cracking. What I'm going to do is uh, mask off the majority of the neck, but then I'm going to do my usual trick of ebonizing the fingerboard. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit of masking tape there with my logo on it. I would normally like to put my logo on the headstock. That's going to take too long for the resin to set, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm just going to put a logo here. Then if I want a logo on the headstock, I'll put it on the truss rod cover, which I may or may not remember to make later. But for now, I have got a fresh roll of masking tape and a neck to ebonize. Okay, so that was 99% successful. Uh, the 1% that's gone a little bit wrong is brand new roll of masking tape. New brand that I've never used before. May have overdone it with the heat gun. There's a bit of sticky residue right where I've put that logo. Uh, that's not great. <laughs> Inevitably, adding the ebonizing fluid uh, to this area raises little uh, wood fibers. You brush those off, and all these black little wood fibers have stuck to all the and it's made it look particularly dirty. I've just run a little test with uh, some wax and grease remover. Perfect. Absolutely perfect. No sticky residue. That'll dry up. Uh, that looks great. Right, I'm now ready to apply some finish to this. And 24 hours, several coats, and a lot of sandpaper later, and I've got a beautifully sealed fingerboard ready for fretting. Got to radius the frets, cut them to length, trim the edges, recut the slots, bang them in, trim the sides, fill the ends, uh, put glue in there, level, crown, polish. Hopefully I can knock this out in a couple of hours because I really don't have time to waste on it taking longer than that. So, uh, got to get stuck right in. I think I'll cut the slots.
Right, we are down to the very last fret, which in this case is the zero fret. Uh, this is the one that's going to be taking all of the strain of all of the strings all of the time. So, I've got one stainless fret. <laughs> um, I am worried. I am worried about bashing it in there because this piece of wood here is so small, it's just going to break off. So there are two things I can do about that. I can uh, get the saw and just try and widen the slot ever so slightly so that it's less pressure going in uh, laterally, laterally as I bang this down uh, into the slot. Or, or, or and, and, um, I've cut this piece of wood, uh, cut the right angles and everything on it to go up against that and brace it. I'm just going to clamp that in place. Probably uh, widen the slot a little bit just just enough um, and hopefully between those two things I can tap that in lightly without having any of this break off And just like that, a beautiful gleaming fingerboard. Uh, I'm rather pleased with the way that's turned out. <laughs> Looks rather good, except for one little cosmetic detail. I didn't put the logo perfectly centred. Should have measured that, uh, but otherwise this is damn near perfect. Uh, and also, while you weren't looking, I finished the back of the neck as well. So this thing is pretty much ready to go on the body. So let's talk about the body. This has got a obviously a very narrow neck on it. I'm going to have to make the pocket considerably wider. That's fine. There's another couple of issues though, not at least of which is that the bolts are also very 
close together. <laughs> I am going to reuse these holes. I'm not going to drill new ones. I believe that if I get the pocket tight enough, there will be no lateral movement. There'll just be nowhere for the neck to move, and then four bolts are just going to suck it onto the body as tight as it could ever need to be. I don't foresee that being a problem at all. What will be a problem, though, and this is a genuine problem, this neck is made from a considerably fatter piece of stock, and of course I've uh, carved this neck pocket to a depth to accommodate that. And that's a lot deeper than I want it to be. This neck blank here isn't going to sit in there uh, to the same height. Uh, so what my plan is, is basically get the pocket to the right size this way, uh, then cut a dirty great shim. Probably uh, the biggest shim I'll ever use on a neck pocket. Uh, probably 5 mil thick should, should be enough. Uh, set that in there. Uh, get that to the right angle and the right thickness, uh, and then just bolt the neck straight on to, on top of that. Uh, if I had more time, obviously I would glue the shim in. It, it, again, if I had more time, I would have uh, got the logo in the right place, and I would also fill and re-drill the neck bolts in the appropriate place. But, right now, as I am speaking to you, I am on stage with this thing in 24 hours, and I really don't care if it's a little bit cosmetically not quite right, you won't see the back of it from the audience, but it's got to be structurally sound. That's what I'm focusing on right now, uh, and that's just what I've got to do, is, uh, yeah, take this neck off, Start carving out that neck pocket, because uh, this thing's moving in. That looks absolutely ridiculous. Like I knew that was going to happen, uh, but uh, yeah, that's that's just that's just funny. <laughs> yeah, definitely going to have to shim that. Um, I reckon five mil ought to do it. Although I'll probably cut a slice that's about seven mil, uh, and then we'll just finesse it to fit. Alright, now, after quite a bit of finagling with this thing, I have got it sitting exactly where I want it. The neck goes on, the neck goes down, the neck stays put. The neck can lift up the body without any added assistance, that is the sign of a nice tight neck pocket. Now, what I was going to do is just bolt that on, but... Uh, I have the option, because it's quite late at night, and I really should, because it is the right thing to do, glue this in. I had hoped to at least string this up tonight, uh, and have a bit of a play on it, but uh, looks like that's going to have to wait for the day of the gig. <laughs> Talk about cutting it fine, but again, I'm, I, really w I really do want to do this properly. I really do. So I will. And in the meantime, before I call it a night, I can of course pop the tuners in here and then that'll be ready to go in the morning. Uh, yes, that sounds like a plan.
And it's the next morning. It's the day of the gig. <laughs> Ordinarily I would be at work right now, but uh, sound checks at 1.30, so I've taken the day off. Which is good, gives me a couple of extra hours to put this on there, put some strings on, and see what we get. Hopefully we get an 8 string bass, that's kind of the point. Uh, not a moment to lose, let's get stuck in. And somehow, miraculously, I've done it. With an hour to spare I might add, which is good because I need to go to the music shop which is right next to the venue, lucky, uh, because uh, when I was cranking on the truss rod uh, I damaged the D string, the high D has snapped on me. Um, that was always going to be the problem one because it's the longest one, it was right at the very end. That is actually, it is long enough, in fact the little bit that broke off is just you know still rattling around on that tuning post, uh, that's as a result of having to crank on the truss rod so much, I was futzing with that thing for ages, but it works, it plays. <laughs> it's not neck heavy, it's fine, stays exactly where I put it. And it actually sounds good. Uh, except, of course, for the D string, because it's missing a string. It's a very weird technique, I'm not used to this at all, but I'm only doing one song on it tonight. There's an interesting technique you might be able to pull off as well, which is if you only play upstrokes, you can just play it like a bass. I'm going to have fun with that. Right. I need to get changed and get ready because it's gig time. And 
that's all I can bring to you from that gig for copyright reasons, because I don't own any of that music. This thing was fine. I sucked. I really, really should have spent more time playing this thing before trying to take it on stage. It wasn't awful. I wasn't happy with my performance, which I think you could probably say about 90% of everything I've ever played. Aside from that, yeah, there are things I would do differently on this bass. First of all, that tuner's in the wrong place. That tuner. Must have marked the wrong line when I put that in. Obviously, I've already talked about the logo being in the wrong place. The neck is so... Like, the, the truss rod's completely maxed out. The carbon fiber rods do nothing. <laughs> you, I want light, 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 tiny, tiny thin gauge strings on here. Uh, uh, maybe a shorter scale would help as well. But at the moment, like, it's playable, and it sounds, it actually sounds pretty good but I would not be taking this thing out again. There's an awful lot that went wrong on this, but there's an awful lot that went right. I've learned a lot. Uh, plus, at the end of the day, it doesn't sound bad. So there you go, we'll call it a first attempt, we'll call it a prototype, I do still need an 8 string bass. This is not the last one of these that I'm going to do on this channel, uh, might have to wait a few weeks until uh, after the Christmas holidays and everything, or maybe during the Christmas holidays, I don't know, I'm not making any promises, because um, you know how good I am at keeping to a schedule. Anyway, in the meantime though, thank you very much for watching, thank you very much for subscribing, and I'll see you real soon, cheers.